I moved to Hawaii in 1960, and the first thing I did upon waking up in Waikiki Beach was walking down to the beach and seeing people surfing. So after that, uh, I went ahead and rented a surfboard with my brother and sister down at Waikiki, and we took turns using it. And we were in Waikiki for probably close to a month before we got some housing. So we went surfing nearly every day. And we weren't very good at it in the beginning, but it was something I knew I really liked. So after about probably close to six months, uh, I wanted to get a board of my own. And my dad went out and shopped around. And boards back then were $150, $175, which was far out of the scope of what uh, kids got money spent on them in that amount. So my dad went to the base exchange and bought a, a foam blank and fiberglass and resin that was in a kit form and it was a pre-shaped blank. All you had to do was lightly sand it to rough it up. So we built my first surfboard and it came out pretty good. And I had a lot of friends that were in the same same situation. They, they wanted boards and uh, their parents weren't about to spend that kind of money for them when you could buy a surfboard kit for about forty dollars. So that was how I started. Uh, the senior, my senior year in high school, I went to work for Hobie in Hawaii and worked until September, and that was when my dad's next tour of duty sent him to Dover, Delaware. These are two boards that are ready for fiberglass right now. They've been airbrushed and shaped. They're sailboards. We kind of hate sailboarders, but, you know, we do it anyway just out of the goodness of our heart, plus they pay cash, you know. We're not happy about it. Over here, we have two blanks that have just been, the shape has just been completed, and they're about to get fiberglass on. This is what the blanks look like in a finished state. Over here is lamination tables, fiberglass tables, drums and resin. <laughs> Plots we use for our fins right here. This is our surfing monkey right here. And uh, these are buckets right here. So I moved to Delaware with my family. And in the springtime, I worked uh, doing roofing and siding for a local company. And in the springtime, I moved down to Ocean City, Maryland, <coughs> and went to work for a Hobie dealer down there doing their ding repairs. And they had some blanks and resin around. So I went ahead and shaped a few boards with their label on them, the, the, the shop label. And I worked for them until about the 4th of July, and I had a falling out with one of the partners in the business. My dad had just purchased property for his retirement home up on Cape Cod, and my mother and brother and sister were already up there. So I drove my dad up there and dropped him off, and then I started traveling around New England uh, for the rest of the summer, and I found that any surf shop that there was, I knew about a thousand percent more than anybody in the local area, and I could get a job either building boards if there was a manufacturer, or doing ding repair. And I was making about $60 a day in 1964, which was a fairly tidy sum of money. So I could stop in a town, ride their waves, rape and pillage their women, repair their surfboards, have someone put me up at their house, and move on to the, the next town. So I got to explore the whole Northeast for most of that summer. First thing you do, cut. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, try, I'll try to tighten up. Okay, what, what happened on this board right here, is it broke, the tail broke off completely. And we glued it back together with a thousand coats of resin, uh, shaped it all back to form, and routed holes in the center right here to put these fiberglass stringers in to add strength so it won't break here again, you know. But before we go any farther, I had to light a cigarette because if there's any anti-smokers out in the audience, I'd rather piss them off right from the start. Okay, um, I just wanted to show you this board as an example of shoddy craftsmanship. 
It's not a brand, and the reason it broke was because of insufficient glass work. The board was sanitation. The layers of fiberglass were sanded too much right from the beginning. And I worked for about six years just trying to learn it on my own in New Jersey. I wound up meeting a man, Carl West, who was known as Tinker to all of his close friends, that was the owner of Challenger Surfboards out in California. And uh, at first, he shot me down heavily. I had a bit of bravado on how good I was, and he told me that I wasn't very good and I would never work for him. And about a year later, he sent an emissary over from his kingdom to come over and talk to him. And when I got there, he told me to pick out a blank that I liked and build myself a board. And when I started to shape it, he started picking it apart by the second on what I was doing wrong. And over the months, he groomed me to shape the way that he did, because it was obvious from what I could watch him shaping side by side uh, to me that he far exceeded anything that I had uh, even attempted to do. So after spending several years working for him, I became the top East Coast shaper. When I came to Florida in the, in the winter of 1973 and set up in Fort Lauderdale at first. I stayed in Fort Lauderdale for a year and a half and in, uh, I guess the spring of 74, you know, I would say it was still 74, I got the hell out of there. Fort Lauderdale was mental misery. So I packed my son and myself up and moved up to, uh, to Cocoa Beach. And uh, I aligned myself with Gary Proper and started building his lightning bolt east. So I had the lightning bolt business to do and my own label. And hanging on to Gary's coattails, it helped propel me along a little bit more. So I just continued on my own, promoting my own product. I changed my surfboard name from Jim Phillips Daily Joy Surfboards to just, just Jim Phillips Surfboards. I'm going to tell you a story on this one. This board, this board was broken in half during Hurricane Gabriel. I spend more time in the shaping. Uh, the shapers for other companies will spend from 30 minutes to an hour shaping a board, and I spend usually an hour and a half to two hours on each board. My long boards, I'll spend about four hours on each one of those. My short boards have a characteristic, and my long board have a characteristic. Uh, most of the shapers that are doing long boards, besides myself, never rode them in the first place and they're not familiar with the design idiosyncrasies that should go along with a longboard. That's why I've captured about 90% of my market is for longboards. And a lot of people don't realize that I shape a, a really respectable shortboard. <laughs> James actually came looking for me. He uh, had moved to Rhode Island from California, and while he was there, he saw my boards all over the beaches in Rhode Island, and he tried to get one of my boards, but he had moved there just a matter of months after I had moved to Florida, so I was unattainable. And he stayed up there and slowly started working his way down the East Coast like I had, gaining employment here and there in the plumbing trade until he got to Cape Canaveral and sought me out then. And I put him to work doing some odd jobs in the beginning and slowly worked his way into the position as a factory manager. The Howley guy, that's a Hawaiian word for white people. But what it originally derives from is Howley meant the faceless ones. Captain Cook's men all wore full facial beards and the Hawaiians never saw their mouths and they considered someone without a smile to have no face. So Howley means the faceless one. But it was a term that became to be associated with the white man, the Howley. So I'm never going to be a Hawaiian, no matter how I cut and dry it. I'm, so I am what I am, a Howley. I would have a hard time saying in the world, but I would place myself with the top shapers in the world. There's a, a handful of people that have the talent that I possess. And I try to be modest about it, 
but my work is evident to other manufacturers and the people that ride my boards as to what my quality and abilities are. But I, I am up there with the top people in the world.